Welcome to The Screen Queen, the show where I'll be talking about your favorite TV show or your favorite movie. You'll just have to listen to find out. This is your host, Samantha Parrish. Hello there and welcome back to the show. My name is Samantha Parrish and I am your lean, mean, movie-talking machine, The Screen Queen. So before I get into this episode, I just have to take a moment to look at the irony again. It has weighed heavily on me this week about how this is the most convenient thing that's ever happened on this show. For a majority of the episodes, I've had some fun with the fact that there are some that come out at a very odd time. But this, this is too oddly specific to have a religious movie be the randomly chosen one for one of the most religious holidays. I love the irony behind it. I still haven't been able to get over it. And, you know, with the fact that faith is kind of up for chance and up for randomness, I'm like, okay, well, I can't deny the fact that this episode had to happen. I don't know if God himself went to my random suggestion list and made it happen. I don't know, but I love the irony. But with a movie like The Prince of Egypt... This is a religious film that's never really been noted about the religious aspects of the film. I've never seen anyone divided over the Prince of Egypt. There are people that have a faith in God that love the movie, and there are sort of atheists that love this movie. Think about that. You have a film that is supposed to be a retelling of the story of Moses to introduce to children, and yet it doesn't offend anybody. That is a first. Like, not even Joel Olstein can get on that level. That is pretty badass. To this day, as I am speaking, the Prince of Egypt has still been regarded as one of the highest points that DreamWorks has ever made. And that is still competing with How to Train Your Dragon and Kung Fu Panda. But the OGs remember the Prince of Egypt, even though I'm not an OG because I grew up with the Shrek generation. But when I got the chance to watch the Prince of Egypt, I could see what everyone was talking about. I had heard about it in my childhood, but I didn't really get around to it till I was much older. And I'm glad that I didn't watch this film until I was much older to comprehend the scripture behind the story of Moses. And what happened to the Hebrews and what happened with Ramesses. It also helped that I watched this with my grandfather so I could further understand and compare the scripture to the story that's being shown by DreamWorks. This is a film that I'd have to say has been on my list for quite some time to talk about. And obviously God rigged my system. So here we go. This is The Prince of Egypt. So obviously, you know what's coming. I'm going to go into the synopsis of what the Prince of Egypt is. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that know the story of Moses, but you know me. I am not about to leave someone in the dark just in case they've never seen this movie. The Prince of Egypt follows the story of Moses, who is the adopted Hebrew son of the Egyptians. And Moses has been a pretty... He's had a pretty lavish life. He's never had to worry about anything. He's conflicted, though. He's always felt that there is something else out there. And it isn't until a woman comes forward and says, You were born of my mother, Yocheved, and you are our brother, and you are our savior. And he's like, "Uh, Lady, I'm a prince. I don't know what you're talking about. However, the things that his sister says does ring with him as everything starts to come together. But with Moses going on a one-on-one with himself, this does put him in a confliction with what he's known. His relationship is tested with his brother Ramesses, who is... Ramesses is set up to be the next pharaoh. And Ramesses is going to do whatever it takes to achieve being Pharaoh, even if that means being at odds with his brother. With the way that the Prince of Egypt came together, I'm just going to have to say it, it is the perfect religious film to show children. I know there are other religious films that came out. There was the Joseph film that his name escapes me. I think it was King of Dreams. And there were other religious films that came out. And then Veggie Tales. 
That was a thing, of course. I forgot. <laughs> but the Prince of Egypt played all the cards right to show what the story of Moses was about. I felt the whole weight of this story that didn't feel that the art was taking away from the story, but that the art was helping the story. Sometimes too much art takes away from the experience, and having something like Moses' story, it's so vitally important to make sure that everything is understood. This is truly a spectacle in storytelling and animation. But as I got to see how this film aged, I noticed that adults gravitate it more than the kids do. And like I said, this is a religious film for children to explain the story. But adults have watched this film more and came back to it. I still don't know to this day if kids are watching this film because given the fact that this is a film that existed in the 90s and since there's so many children's films coming out, the Prince of Egypt just sort of lives vicariously through that crowd of kids in the 90s that carried it on. However, because it is still carried on, it finds a new audience and most of that audience is adults, myself included. And it's kind of nice to see a film that is celebrated by people that don't have to have a religious preference to watch this film, but don't have a preference in general to watch this film. There is no one that ever complains about having to watch The Prince of Egypt because there's so many things to take away from it. People watch it for the art. People watch it for the story. People watch it for it being DreamWorks. I've always said you choose how you want to be entertained. Someone has always managed to find something out of this film and appreciate it for that factor. You know a movie is doing something right if someone goes back to it and someone can find what they want out of that movie. And with it being a religious film, that's kind of an intriguing thing that the religious aspect didn't turn people off. But whenever I see people talking about The Prince of Egypt... I hear Ramesses mentioned more than Moses, and that's a lot to have to think that the secondary character is more popular than your main character. The whole thing is about Moses. But then again, the film is pushed because Ramesses is a part of Moses' evolution and the fact that he has to push away from his brother as they come to a parting of ways. You feel the tragedy between these two brothers as... Moses has to do what is right. Ramesses is just as compelling as Moses is. When people talk about the film, the focus is always about Ramesses' emotions. But even when Ramesses gets to a point that he's basically hardened his heart to Moses, there's still parts of him that is still vulnerable. And there's not many villains out there that we see that still has some semblance of love and loyalty. And that's solely when Ramesses' son is introduced. And even though he will literally have all of the Hebrews do a buttload of work until the day they die, but if his son says, Dad, I'm scared, he stops everything. The emotions behind this, this character, it's one for the books. Ramesses became the father that he never had. You get to see this character go from being a sympathetic character to a villain. And you see that steady incline. Just as you see Moses' steady incline from bringing a spoiled brat to a mature figure, a leader. This just came to my mind. These are two characters that are supposed to be leaders, but they became two entirely different leaders with two entirely different morals. One that has morals and one that just doesn't. One doesn't really outweigh the other because you do understand the weight of everything. Ramesses is doing this because he's destined to be Pharaoh. He knows he's got to fill those shoes, but unfortunately he's not ready. There's so much confliction in Ramesses that is going to make it unfortunately true that he's going to, like Moses said, bring down the pyramids. Everything, unfortunately, comes true. It's almost like a pre-prediction of what is going to foretell with Moses and Ramesses. The whole progression of this plot, you see the tragedy behind this relationship, that you know what's going to happen. You know that Moses is going to somehow get his people out of Egypt 
and do what God told him to do. And unfortunately, he knows Ramesses is not going to listen. But damn, a part of you does wish Ramesses would listen. This film makes you want something that just isn't going to happen. That's where the tragedy is behind these two characters. Ramesses is as important as Moses is, and Moses is as important as Ramesses is. It goes hand in hand very perfectly. Not many animated films have that weight of tragedy behind it. And I can see why people look at that more and kind of forget about the religious aspect and just enjoy the story about what's going to happen. Even when I watch it, I kind of forget, oh yeah, this is a religious film, but I'm so engrossed in it, I forgot. Now, I'm going to make a segue into one of the points that I've been dying to talk about. And that's the music of this movie. The music in The Prince of Egypt does not get enough credit. It almost physically hurts me. It's almost sinful for the fact that this soundtrack isn't talked about. I'm going to see if I can contact some kind of Bible association and put down some sin in there saying it's a sin to not love the Prince of Egypt soundtrack. And I think people would agree with me. I don't know how I would make that happen, but I would make that happen. But when I was rehearsing for this episode, it dawned on me that there's not many happy songs in this film. Looking at the outside of the Prince of Egypt, you would think, it's DreamWorks, they're going to have a whole bunch of happy-go-lucky songs, but it's the story of Moses, so how the hell would you have happy-go-lucky songs with such dark material? You have songs that are placed in there at appropriate moments that pushes the storytelling even farther. Now let's run through the songs real quick. There's the opening called Deliver Us that carries the film to open everything about the story of Moses and what's going on and what's at stake. Then there is the All I Ever Wanted song, which I kind of call it the confliction song, sort of like Bell song and Beauty and the Beast. Uh, and In Heaven's Eyes, which was the plot progression for Moses. I would call it the Moses montage, the Mosetage, if you will. And then there's my one of my favorite songs, Playing with the Bid Boys by Steve Martin and Martin Short, The Plagues, and then finally, When You Believe. So there's like two songs in there that are like your palate cleansers, and then the rest of it, they just fit the tone of the story. I don't think of many films that could do that and do it perfectly without having to feel like it's an overtax on your emotions. Everything is carried correctly that you have parts where there's just singing from the characters to talk about the emotions and then just having songs that are just done by a chorus. And I love the fact that this film is a half and half with that. But there's a question that I always ask whenever I watch this film. How come Val Kilmer didn't sing in the movie? Now, whenever I watch this film, it makes me mourn for Val Kilmer's voice, and I'm so glad that he's okay. But Val Kilmer's voice in this movie is like ASMR. It is so perfect for this character that is so comforting. But Val Kilmer does have a decent singing voice. He sung for The Doors. I know there's been some complaints and some criticism about how he... Uh, sang for The Doors, but he's not a bad singer, and I'm honestly surprised that his singing voice is not in there. I don't know what happened in this film. I've done some digging, and I found nothing as to the reason why Val Kilmer was not giving his singing voice in there. Maybe he just kind of had enough and just wanted to leave it to someone professional, but a majority of the cast already sings. Michelle Pfeiffer sings in the film. Ralph Fiennes sings in this movie. Maybe Val Kilmer was just like kind of done, like I said. But still, there's something that I can't help but point out every time I watch it. But at the same time, I also get so swept away by the singing in this film that I kind of forget my own question to shut up and enjoy the film. But I do have to go into detail about how much I love playing with the big boys. I am a huge fan of a villain song. Playing with the big boys is kind of like if you married poor unfortunate souls with Hakuna Matata. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. it. Is a spectacle. It's often been criticized that such a villainous song comes from what is called the comedic relief. 
but they're frauds. And they're feeding into the fact that Ramesses is a power-hungry dude. They're selfish. They are. They're basically like more intimidating Iagos is if is probably the best way I can say it. So I 100% buy playing with the big boys. Now we have more of a focus on these high priests that kind of call themselves like magicians. I believe that was mentioned here and there because they do use some form of fraud magic to get across of certain miracles to be able to disprove God and everything. And they use certain special effects to be able to get that across. And I love during this number that Moses is just kind of disgusted. Like, these are two people he used to make fun of, drop shit on. And now he's like, dude, I'm seeing through your facade. I ain't liking it. This is not cool. It is the one part of the movie I always look forward to. And every time it plays in my iPod, you bet I'm going to crank this shit up to 100 and try to play both roles at the same time. It's just that damn good. And then I have to remind myself, that's Steve Martin and Martin Short singing. These two dudes play a good job playing good guys and bad guys, but this is the first time I've actually heard them and forgot that these are two comedic gems doing a very devious song. And then there's my other favorite song, The Plagues. The Plagues is probably one of my favorite chorus pieces in any film, and that's a hard list to get on for me because I like a lot of sweeping numbers. I will not say no to a song that has a chorus ballad. This is the song where it's like, God's not fucking around. He really meant, if you don't listen and get the people out of Egypt, some bad shit's going to happen. This is the song that's like the cause and the effect. The cause was Ramesses and the effect was the plague. But I also love this for being not just a cause and effect song, but an internal conflict song as well. This is, is a song that has way too many genres going on and yet has a way to balance itself, being multifaceted. You get the first half of this song being the introduction of the plagues, and then it moves into the internal thoughts of Ramesses and Moses, where Moses wishes that it didn't have to come this way, and Ramesses also wishes the same thing too. But Ramesses has more animosity, where he feels that he has been betrayed by Moses. That, like, he even says in the song, Brother, why have you come to hate me so? Why would you betray me? It's like, he didn't do any betraying. You're just a fucking selfish leader. But like I mentioned earlier, with one of the film's driving points being the confliction between Moses and Ramesses, this really brings it on home. But with more of a mention on the plagues, there's something that I want to point out about this film for you to go back and rewatch. Because this blew my mind. Look at the color palette in the plagues. There is an orange color used for Moses, and there is a blue color used for Ramesses to signify literally night and day. Their thoughts are night and day. How different they are. And the way that it's always been from the get-go. It was always meant to be like this. I do love all of the other songs uniquely and individually as the others, but... Those are some of the most underappreciated songs within any animated film, or film in general. I'll just go ahead and put it all out there in the grand plethora of it all. But if that wasn't enough, having an amazing cast doing the singing, minus Val Kilmer, the soundtrack for the film is oh, fucking amazing. I mean, we're talking Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston did When You Believe... Afra Haza and Eden Regal, I hope I didn't botch their names, did Deliver Us. Amic Bram and Linda Diane Shane did the Queen's Reprise of All I Ever Wanted. Um, and then at the very end, you have I Will Get There from Boys to Men. Now, I don't really dig into a lot of Boys to Men. They're just there. But I... I like the fact that they're a part of this film, but I love the fact that there are so many people in this film. It kind of feels like the We Are the World with Michael Jackson, but, you know, with less people. But you have the kind of ones that you would want to show up, that you know they're going to bring everything in the kitchen sink. 
Like, I'm kind of still shocked that Whitney Houston's not talked about enough for being in this film. She was busy with the other film, what was it, uh, The Preacher's Wife, but I'm like, I wonder why Whitney Houston wasn't talked about for The Prince of Egypt. I'm still kind of shocked about it. I mean, I've said that a lot. There's a lot of things that shock me as to why there are so many well-known people in this film, and they don't get talked about how they did such a great job for this film, whether it's the animation, the soundtrack, the acting, the animation, everything. I feel like I'm going to get winded by the time I'm done with this movie. I'm not even done with my points yet. Well... I feel like it's that time in the episode to talk about the accuracies of Moses' story in this film. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I watched this movie with my grandfather, and I just took a shot just to watch it with him, and I'm very glad that I did, because he knows the story of Moses. My grandfather is a very proud Christian man. And he's a very stubborn Christian man, too. I'm just going to put it out there. I love him, but the man is adamant on making sure that God's word is respected and followed. However, he also became one of many that also likes this movie and did not crap on this storyline having to do some minor changes. This is a kid's film and they kind of have to do some changes without having to expunge history. But there were some things he pointed out about this film that have stuck with me. During the scene where God sweeps through Egypt and takes the firstborn sons, it's not a white cloud that comes through. It's a black cloud that comes through Egypt and smites the firstborns. When he explained that to me, it changed the way that I saw the film, but didn't take away the experience. But I also felt like I got to really understand the depth of the story to know what really happened while we were watching it. My grandfather didn't have any criticisms about any of the film. He still felt that with it being a children's film about Moses, still upheld the story and the minor changes weren't too bad. But I also did my own homework on what these other key figures within the biblical story of Exodus was in charge of. Did I read the Bible? No, I have to say my source is Wikipedia because unfortunately many scripture just goes right over my head and I wouldn't be able to understand this and this would be able to get the point across. So if you are interested in getting the story of Exodus, I wouldn't take it from your host right here who's not well versed. I don't want to get the wrong information across, but I am going to say what is enough information across. So, of course, Moses is, well, the guy who leads the Hebrews out of Egypt. But I did my digging to see who Miriam and Aaron were. From what I read about Miriam... She still did her thing. She still helped out Moses afterwards when she knew her mother's words came true that her brother would lead the Hebrews out of, Je out of Egypt. I almost said lead the Hebrews out of Jesus. That was terrible. Oh, my goodness. She was a prophetess, and she helped out with Moses' word. The brother of Moses, Aaron, later on became a high priest, and I find that to be a little bit cool looking at the whole grand scheme of things, considering his sister-in-law, who is Zipporah, whose father is a high priest. So things kind of still ran in the family. Everything was still good in, in the, uh, the family of Moses. And then for my own amusement, I wanted to see if there was really a Hotep and Hoy, who were the fake high priests within the film. Hotep did not exist, but Hoy definitely did. Hotep uh, translates to an Egyptian words to uh, to be satisfied at peace. The word also refers to offering, uh, richly presented to a deity or a dead person. So, you know, kind of ironic. Hoy, though, was a high priest uh, under Ramesses II. So that's about as much as I'm going to gloss upon for the real life counterparts for the story of Exodus. Again, I'm not very 
religiously versed. And I'd rather leave that to someone that will understand it and explain it much better than I can. I'm just here to give fun shit and trivia. And, you know, real facts on top of that too. But whatever was within my power. So, you know this was going to happen. Now is the time to talk about the cast of the Prince of Egypt. I've sprinkled some stuff in here and there, but I wanted to give the Prince of Egypt its own point about the cast. Because I'm still shocked, once again, that the cast of this movie is not known for this movie. Now, there are a lot of big players in here, so of course they're going to have a lot on their acting resume. But it's so severely overlooked with how the cast owned these characters. Well, I, yeah, there's no easy way to say it. They, they, you, they brought these characters to life. But they did it in such a way that I almost forgot who was voicing these characters. But I can still pick apart who is who. Val Kilmer being in this film, I was kind of shocked about. From what I remember, Val Kilmer wasn't really a big Christian back in the day until he finally had his come to Jesus later on after his uh his lung cancer. But when he was in this film, he brings the right amount of vulnerability. And this is the first that I've ever seen him play a character that's vulnerable. I mean, shit, in the 90s, he was Jim Morrison, he was an FBI agent, he was a hitman, and then you have him play Moses. You know, a role that could go so right or so wrong. And I don't know if I could have anyone else play Moses except for Val Kilmer. It's a testament to how much Val Kilmer can bring so much to a film. I know he wasn't everyone's favorite guy back in the 90s because he had a bit of an arrogant pissant problem. But knowing that he has a peace with himself these days... I can imagine that he does have a special place in his heart for this film being a part of a process that was able to show the story of Exodus to children. And he made this such a serious way that it really brought Moses into a huge highlight that you felt the weight of his responsibilities, his actions, and his morals. Also, I have one more note about Val Kilmer. I love the way he says in this film... I love you to Zipporah. I could marry that scene and listen to it for the rest of my life and be perfectly content. I don't know why. I just feel like it's such an intimate moment in this kid's film that has just the kind of weight to it. You don't see that in too many kid's films, and I kind of love it for that. And then there's Ramesses voiced by Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes, oh man, he's done so many things that I have lost count. But like I mentioned earlier with how an audience focuses on Ramesses is solely with the way Ray Fiennes bring this, brings us to life. When I went to go back and rewatch The Prince of Egypt, and it was at the scene where his son was one of the firstborns that had been taken uh, when God swept through Egypt. The quiet way that he says, you and your people have my permission to leave is... That quiet line was said with so much tragedy that it felt loud. Ray Fiennes brought that to Ramesses. He still brought those moments that you felt intimidated and moments that you felt sympathetic for him. And then there's Michelle Pfeiffer as Zipporah. And I will never in my life say no to a Michelle Pfeiffer film. I love Michelle Pfeiffer. I've watched her pretty much all of my life, so I got introduced to her at a young age and seeing the talents that she brings. And I've talked about her before in Frankie and Johnny, but I still feel so much pain in my heart that she's not too well known for this film because I love the way that she brings just the right amount of emotion to Zipporah. Given the fact that these are fictionalized version of the titular people from the chapter of Exodus... Still, it brings the right amount of maturity and the right amount of fun. I love the part in the film where Zipporah's character is wondering why her three sisters are pulling a rope uh, 
around the well. And when the sister says, we're trying to get the funny man out of the well. And she's like, oh, the funny man out of the well. And when she realizes that there is a man in the well, she's like, oh, don't, don't worry, I got you. Like, I love that because it's such a, a wonderful amount of panic. And it's one of my favorites. And then there's my favorite guys, Steve Martin and Martin Short as Hotep and Hoy. And I've already given a lot of praise to these guys earlier in the film, and I'm not done praising them yet. I've known that they've done a lot of movies together. These two are best friends. And if there's a project they can be in together, you know they're going to do whatever they can. They are the epitome of the saying, you can trust us to work together. We will behave ourselves. No, 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 no. These two dudes don't behave themselves, and I'm glad they don't, you know, in the best ways possible. I love the fact that these two dudes have always played comedic relief, but to have them play comedic relief in a sinister way, but yet they still have so much comedy behind their characters, that still comes off as comedy gold. One of my favorite moments with their characters is near the beginning when uh, Moses drops this, like, I, I don't know what the fuck it is. It's just some kind of, like, juice onto them, and it spills all over Hotep and Hoy. And after I realized that the characters are voiced by Steve Martin and Martin Short, I could finally hear that it's them. And when they're going, Ramesses, get down here! And Steve Martin says, oh, my new thing! <laughs> it fucking kills me. <laughs> Every time. And I don't know why, but when people look at that scene, they don't find it so funny. And I'm like, maybe I have like a poor sense of humor. I'm easy to laugh, but that thing has me in stitches. I know it's an odd thing to have to hear an Egyptian say, but I'll buy it. It's a kid's film. It's a great part. They did a great job putting a lot of humor into this kid's film. I'm kind of glad that they got these two guys to work together because it feeds into the chemistry. If you're going to have two characters that are conniving together and you know they're like always going to do whatever benefits them because they like to work selfishly together, of course you want to have two people that work so well off of each other in real life to play these characters. It's another one of the reasons I love this film was how it utilized how to get the most into this film by having people that work well together. So the last two actors I wanted to talk about in this film, I kind of want to put them together for a reason, and that's Sandra Bullock and Jeff Goldblum as Miriam and Aaron. After the first couple of times I watched this film, I wasn't sure who voiced these characters, even though it should have been clear writing on the wall who was the voice of the characters. And I don't know why it shocked me that Sandra Bullock was the voice of Miriam, even though after learning who it was, then it came together. But the writing is so good that I don't pay attention to the voice of the person, but I pay attention to what they're saying. And Sandra Bullock has always had a knack for everything that she's gone into that makes everything sound so believable that you fall in love with her character. And with this character being more on the background side of things, where she's not the main focused character, she still makes it count in all the right ways. Even with her not being physically seen, she still brings the right amount of emotion to every character. And this is when she was still in the up and up as an actress. And knowing the fact that this was one of her first uh, ventures into DreamWorks before she was a part of the Minions franchise, it's like night and day. When you see her as Miriam... And then you see her as the villain from Minions. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. But then there's Jeff Goldblum. This might be my favorite Jeff Goldblum movie of all time. And I don't even see him in it. I know this guy has had a career of oh, so many oh, characters that are in the throes of so many actiony things and whatever. It's probably the world's worst Jeff Goldblum action. But you get what I mean. This guy's kind of iconic for being a joke in so many films. Half the time, he just embraces his own nuances that they've just become meme material. But I love the fact that he has the right amount of humor in this film that still makes it a kid's film. And it brings a bit of a palate cleanser. Like I said, there's so many serious things in this film that him having a couple lines here and there is pretty great. 
One of my favorite lines he says in the film is near the beginning when Aaron and Miriam uh, find Moses and Miriam uh, is just so ecstatic with life. But Aaron is so terrified and Aaron says, Miriam, do you want to have us flogged? But I love the way that he says it with so much seriousness and humor that there is some fear in his voice, but the fear still comes off as funny. Or at least I still find it funny because Jeff Goldblum just finds a way to make lines that aren't funny and makes them funny. But I also love the fact that there are moments with Jeff Goldblum's character that he does make it serious. And I don't really hear a lot of times that Jeff Goldblum is serious as the character. It's a true testament to him as an actor that when he's serious, he does make it count. And him being in this film is a very underrated example of that. Okay, I have a couple of bonus notes, but I also don't understand why Helen Mirren is not credited enough as her role as Moses's mother, well, adoptive mother in this film. She's not in the film very long with her character, given the fact that not a lot of Pharaoh's wives have a very long life, but she does make it count for being a very supportive mother to Moses. She's actually one of the very few characters in the movie where you actually have someone who is on Moses' side and isn't trying to lean him towards a certain way. Like, okay, I don't regret the fact that you just washed up here one day and I'm glad you're my son. And Helen Mirren had a beautiful way of bringing that character to life. But then there's the other side of it with Patrick Stewart as the Pharaoh. It still brings chills down my spine every time he says in the film, Oh, my son, they were only slaves. And I'm like, oh, no one should ever have to say that in their life. But the way that it was said, it does get the point across that this is what Pharaoh does. He's malicious. He had no problem killing babies because he was worried about being overthrown and tried to make that sound justified. I know Patrick Stewart has done so many films, but I don't think I've ever seen him play a character as sinister as that. Even though that does play to real life, unfortunately, still, it plays to real life in a way that you get the point in a very, very powerful and painful way. I feel like the perfect way to end this episode is to talk about why it's such a great animated film. The recreation of The Parting of the Red Sea took two years to animate looking at how grand it is i i can definitely feel the the weight of work that went into that scene even if it's only for just a few seconds but it's held in such a way that it feels like a lifetime that you're looking at that scene but there are some other great moments as well that don't really get the kind of attention, especially where this is a film that has a lot of detail in the detail in the details. When you get the whole grand look at Egypt, it is just marvelous. Even the most harsh film critiquers can't deny how beautiful the detail is in this movie. But there's another part of the animation that really changed the way I saw this is every time you see Ramesses, he is always under his father's reign even when his father is not in the room there's a part where Ramesses is pointing for Moses to leave and you see the pharaoh is over his shoulder the statue of the pharaoh is nearby there's another part where Ramesses is always sitting in the pharaoh statue as if he's sitting in his father's lap it really builds into the storytelling but you really feel the emotion even when there's something presently going on but just the way that the shadows cast over the characters or again the orange and blue highlights to indicate the differences of all the characters there's so many things that makes this a powerful piece of storytelling so for my final note about the prince of egypt if i've said it one I'll say it again, and I'm just going to keep saying it. It's a perfect religious film that does not feel very religious. And it, and because of that, it reaches so many people. It's nice to see a film that isn't at face value. That you 
take what you want from the film. There's so many aspects to appreciate this film from the animation, the story, the music, everything. It's what you would want out of a movie, especially a kid's film. But then again, I almost dare to call it a kid's film because it feels like a film for everybody. There are so many people between the young, the old, the religious, the non-religious that still keep coming back to this film, and it's hard to not see why. So, before I get into the news about what's going to be happening for the birthday series on the screen, Queen, I have a very important announcement. I've been pretty vocal on this show about a community that I'm a part of called Open Mic Night. I go there every Thursday. I've talked about some of the people from Open Mic Night on here many times. And there's a friend of mine that I've known for years named Dylan Dillard. I always joke and call him king and he calls me queen. He is the swellest dude. And he had to go to the hospital. And we got the news that he is in need of a liver transplant. And the community has been so kind as to make a GoFundMe for his medical bills to help with the liver transplant. I got in contact with one of my friends from Open Mic Night who gave me the link that I will be supplying in the description box. Dylan is one of the most selfless people that I've known and he's never talked about his problems. He's always willing to listen to others. He's heard me and my bullshit so many times and I I want to do whatever I can to help him out, and that's why I'm here to raise attention for this GoFundMe that is still growing, and I want to help it to keep growing. I myself, I'm going to be donating to Dylan's medical bills, and I'm not the best at talking about this stuff, and I don't want to come across as preachy or trying to get people to donate, but... I'm asking for people that can be able to donate, and I'm also asking if there's anyone that can be able to share this to the people that it can go to to help Dylan's case. With this being Easter coming up, I'm really praying for a miracle for Dylan. He doesn't deserve to die. He deserves a better life, and I know there are people out there that can help him. So... Now is the time to find out what the next episode is going to be on the Screen Queen. But most of you know that when it comes to the month of April, that is my birthday month. And just like last year, I'm also going to be turning that into one whole month of my favorite movies and TV shows. Even though I've covered a lot of my favorites since my birthday series that I did, and to my surprise, I still found more of my favorites that I haven't covered yet. I guess I have more favorites than I than I can count. <laughs> so, you all know the drill. I put a whole bunch of random suggestions in a box, and then we all find out what the next episode is going to be together. So here we go. Vanna White makes it look so easy. Okay, alrighty. I got one in my hand. What are you? <gasps> oh my god. I am holding one of the ones in my hand that I've been waiting to do for such a long time! Alrighty. So for the first up on the birthday series is going to be The People vs. Larry Flint. Oh, I'm so excited for that one. Y'all have no idea. Okay. Well, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of The Screen Queen. You all are amazing and I love you all. If you want to catch up with me in between uploads, you can find me on my Instagram at the Queen of the Screen. We can talk about how great the Prince of Egypt was or how much Val Kilmer's voice sounded like butter. I'm so down for that conversation. If you would like to see the funny movie-related content that I seldomly put up on TikTok, you can find me at The Mystical Space Witch. And if you're interested in the book series I wrote that also has some <laughs> ties to religion in there, you can find the Inglory Sync series in the description box. And you can find the link to donate to Dylan's cause. 
Thank you so much for being here. You all take care now, and happy Easter. This is your screen queen, signing off. Bye-bye!